3.30 in the afternoon, September 9th, 1943. <clears throat> the fleet was moving placidly through the Mediterranean on its way south. It was a beautiful clear day, it had been warm, the water was still. The fleet was moving and knew it was being followed by some airplanes, probably reconnaissance airplanes just keeping track of it. But about 3.30, six airplanes appeared on the horizon and started to trail at about a five mile range. The Admiral of the fleet didn't know if those were Allied airplanes or if they were enemy airplanes. The Admiral was about to find out. At about 3.40, the six airplanes started to form a very loose, sloppy gaggle and approach the fleet. As the airplanes came, there was no real need for concern. This fleet had weathered much worse than six bombers. This fleet had been bombed heavily by hundreds of Allied bombers just weeks before with no damage. How much could these six airplanes carry? Six, eight, maybe ten bombs each? This was going to be a nuisance attack at most. But the fleet, as a precaution, began some simple uh, evasive maneuvers just to throw the bomb aimers off a little bit and just to show that they could maneuver a large fleet. As the airplanes approached, the first one released its bomb. It was still about three miles out. The bomb, a single bomb, arced gently toward a target in the fleet. Now there were two big targets in that fleet. There were two battleships. One of them was named the Roma, the other was the Italian. They were the two principal capital ships in the Italian Navy at the time. And they were considered extremely high value targets by either side. Now remember, it's September 9th, 1943. This bomb arcs gently down, but the ship begins a maneuver, turning to the left. To the amazement of every observer topside, the bomb also moves to the left. Imagine how that must have felt at that moment. After years of experience with, with bombs, watching them fall harmlessly to one side or the other, the bombs seemed to move as the ship moved. The first bomb crashed through the stern deck of the Roma. It passed through six decks and exited through the bottom of the ship and exploded under the keel. The explosion flooded the after engine room. Immediately two of the four massive screws propelling the ship shut down. Fires were started. The ship slowed. Another bomb from another airplane started to arc gently toward the ship. What you see is a vision of what the, Ital the Roma looked like on that day. She was the flagship of the Italian Navy. And I want to set a scene for you that leads up to the battle that leads to the loss of the Roma. She was a big ship. She was a big ship by anyone's standards, bigger than anything the Germans had built at that time, and certainly an equal to any of the early war, World war, uh, early war U.S. Car uh, battleships at the time in terms of size and in terms of capability. Her, her use during the war, unfortunately for the Italian Navy, had been limited largely to stationary anti-aircraft duty due to an acute shortage of uh, fuel and a shortage of suitable escort ships to put her into service. Now, as I mentioned earlier, it's September 9th, 1943. Bombing at the time, especially bombing of moving targets, by high-flying, medium, or heavy bombers was notoriously iffy. Picture on the bottom left, 
was pushing my buttons in the wrong place. <laughs> The picture on the bottom left shows the results of a B-17 attack on a Japanese aircraft carrier in 1942. All those spots are where the bombs landed, none of them even remotely close to where the aircraft carrier is. That's fairly common. What the Allies did was they predicated their attack on large numbers of aircraft, carpet bombing large targets. If you look in the top right, you can see the town of Vessel. This was a combination of U.S. and British attacks on, a, on a, an industrial city, but there was no hope of hitting an individual target reliably. It simply wasn't going to happen. The Allies had learned this to their cost when they tried to knock out the German battle, uh, pocket cruiser, battle cruiser Tirpitz in Norway. This ship was stationary, and in spite of it being stationary, the British could not hit the darn thing. They just couldn't get it. It took two years to sink that ship. So what happened? German experience in 1936 in Spain had demonstrated to them that hitting moving targets at sea, especially high value targets, was going to take something special. And the way they handled that was pretty simple. They put some scientists to work to develop a guided bomb. This device that you see in this picture was the FZ-1400. It would become known as the Fritz X. This was not a small bomb. This thing was 11 feet long. It weighed over 3,000 pounds and packed more than 750 pounds of amatol explosive. <coughs> the nose of the bomb was heavily armored to allow it to penetrate. But what's amazing about the bomb is the tail fin. The tail fin incorporated remotely controlled spoilers, those little things that go up on the wings. When you're landing at Lindbergh, you see them pop up. Those are called spoilers. The spoilers allowed a controller to project both range and beam direction on the bomb. This was new. The bomb was unpowered. That big hole you see on the back was a place to shove a giant flare so that the bomb aimer would be able to control the bomb. But it was extraordinary. It was developed by a fellow named Dr. Cromer. Dr. Cromer had worked on this thing, had been working on it since 1938, and had worked diligently, and had been able to demonstrate the ability to hit a target the size of a ship about 50% of the time, not just hit it, but hit it where he wanted to hit it. Again, imagine this thing hunting you, because that's what it was doing. The way the bomb worked is really simple. It had a very simple, how many of you have flown a remote control airplane? You would not be unfamiliar with the controls for this device and probably could be quickly made into an expert uh, in the use of it if you had the right glasses on. Launched from about 18,000 feet, the bomb had a range of approximately three miles. So optimum range about three miles out. That's exactly where Roma's bomb was released from. As the Germans had worked with this bomb, they realized that it was going to be usable to them, but they were going to have to have dedicated units put together to, to, to use the weapon. They started by forming a three-group Kampfgeschwader 100, which was um, uh, like a squadron within a group. It was uh, nicknamed Viking. W-I-K-I-N-G, and they had a big Viking ship as their, as their, their, uh, I'm sorry, there's a nice close-up of the tail again. There's the controller operating the controller. You can see him manipulating the joystick on the controller. This aircraft is an Henschel HS-293, and it saw service at about the same time. 
Both of these aircraft were launched with their weapons were launched for the first time in late August 1943, but it wasn't until early September that they were being used in earnest. The interesting thing about both of them is that they both used the same transmitter, the same receiver, and operated on the same frequencies. The 293 was intended for unarmored targets. It was simply an SC-500 bomb to which wings were attached. The little rocket underneath was used to get the thing away from the aircraft on launch so that the controller could keep his eye on it. This is a Dornier 217K2 flying pencil was the nickname of these airplanes. <coughs> this was the airplane that was optimized for use of the Fritz X. Technically, the airplane could carry two of them, but if you can imagine hauling two 3,000 pound bombs underneath one of these things on a long range mission, most missions were flown with one bomb. You can see the emblem of the, of the Viking unit down in the bottom left. There were, the, this airplane was special built for this purpose and relatively few were built. Three group only had 12 airplanes. Pardon? Only 12 the whole war? Yeah. No, they built more than 12, but they never had more than 12 in the squadron at one time, and fewer than that were usually serviceable. This is an extremely rare picture. It shows members of the ground crew of the, of the three group preparing a bomb to be attached to one of the Dornier 217s. The squadron was based at Istra, which is near Marseille in France. Now, Istra was about 200 miles away from where the Italian fleet was sailing. And now we can kind of fast forward. Go ahead. This is a Heinkel 177, a notoriously unreliable but extremely advanced driven quasi-heavy bomber. I know it looks like it's twin engine. It has four engines. The engines are buried in the wing and through a very complicated gearbox drove two propellers one propeller per pair. This aircraft could carry three 293s, which were quite a bit lighter than the Fritz X. And this is what the Fritz X would have looked like as it was deployed. This is the result of the second bomb. The second bomb hit, hit just five minutes after the first. This bomb penetrated the deck right next to the number two turret went down four decks and exploded right at the base of the ship, opening up two huge holes in the base of the, base of the ship, shutting down the forward engine room. The ship came to a complete stop and starting significant fires, the worst of which was in the magazine for the number two turret. In less than two minutes, the magazine blew up. It caused a mushroom cloud that raised 3,000 feet You've all seen a battleship, pictures of battleships. Those turrets weigh literally hundreds of tons. The number tur two turret was thrown 300 feet in the air and landed in the ocean alongside. In fewer than 20 minutes, the ship had turned over, broken in half, and sunk. The Italia suffered a hit directly in the bow that caused damage that put her out of the war for the rest of the year. And Actually, for the rest of the war, she didn't see any combat. And two near misses, which also caused considerable damage. The fact is that this bomb had wreaked in just a space of about six minutes extraordinary havoc, and they had done it with just six airplanes and three hits. Pretty remarkable. That's the mushroom cloud. This was taken from one of the accompanying destroyers. The reason the Germans were bombing the Italians this day is kind of interesting. It's 9th of September. On the 8th of September, in utmost secrecy, U.S. High Command has signed a surrender agreement with the Italian military. The Italian military had agreed to switch sides. Now, the Italian fleet at the time was at La Spezia, which is in northern Italy, and it was their primary naval base, and was in a part of Italy that was still heavily occupied by the Germans. The admiral of the fleet had decided that he wanted to get his ships out of there. He did receive instruction to go to an area where that was controlled by the Allies. 
He was a little uncomfortable with those instructions and decided that he was going to go first to Sardinia. Well, Sardinia was also in German hands, so he received further instructions directing him to go to Malta, which was his compromise. Unfortunately, that left him in range of the German bombers at Marseille. The Germans did not want those ships to get into Allied hands because in 1943, the outcome of the war was still in doubt. The Germans had just suffered a couple of setbacks on the, on the Eastern Front, but the Western Front was still nine months away. And who was going to win the war at this point was, was clearly not decided. The Germans wanted to have some influence on that. Their submarines were still wreaking havoc in the, in the Atlantic Ocean. They still had a chance, and they knew that transferring these ships over would just make it that much harder. So these ships became high-value targets for the Germans. In that 10 minutes, 20 minutes, the Roma sank and took with her 1,200 crewmen, including the admiral, who had made the fateful decisions, the captain, 86 of her officers, and they were gone just like that. The six German airplanes turned around and flew back to Marseille. They did not know that they had sunk the ship because they hadn't remained on scene to, to watch the results. And they proceeded back to Marseille. They landed without incident. But it wasn't the end for, for the Kampfgeschwader. Over the next 21 days, they would damage the cruisers Savannah, Philadelphia, British cruiser Uganda, the British battleship Warspite. They would damage a British destroyer and a Dutch sloop. All of them, most of them, including the Savannah, didn't see combat again for the rest of the war. That's the Savannah. And you can see the hole right there that is conveniently about two and a half feet wide, the width of a Fritz X. That's the top of a turret, heavily armored. When these bombs hit, they hit with some 700 miles per hour velocity. And with that armored nose, they could easily penetrate even the thickest armor on these ships. This particular one exploded in the ammunition in the other way. Savannah lost it. Four of them were below decks and couldn't get out until the ship reached a repair facility. Couldn't get out until the ship reached a repair facility in Malta, and then they had to be um, torched out. So four, four, four guys were stuck in there for 20 days. Right after the attacks on the Uganda and the war spike, the squadron was recalled from combat and sent for rest in northern France. When they were returned to combat in April of 44, they found things had changed. One of them was that a Heinkel 177 had been captured by the Allies on the island of Sardinia. And inside it, they found the control box for a Henschel 293. Also, the Allies had captured an intact Henschel 293 with its receiver unit attached. And in this picture, you can see the 293 they captured, plus the control box on the left that was taken out of the Heinkel 177. So these two devices together, and bear in mind I mentioned that these things were exactly the same for both weapons, gave the Allies a clear vision of how these weapons were controlled, what made them track the target. So when Kampfgeschwader 100 returned to combat in April, they found that the Allies had developed electronic countermeasures to deal with these bombs. It is amazing how fast technology moves when it has to. They also returned to a completely different environment. Over the Mediterranean, they had relatively little aerial opposition. were what they call MACLOS, M-C-L-O-S, Manual Control Line of Sight, which means that the controller had to be able to put eyes on the, on the target and on the device 
for the entire process. With the Dornier 217, when they would drop the bomb, you know, you drop the bomb and the bomb gradually falls behind you. In order to maintain that, that line of sight, the Dornier 17 would drop the bomb and then go into a steep climb in order to decelerate while the bomb continued forward. Then the bomber would reduce speed and go to level flight and would track the bomb that way. The airplane had to fly straight and level on the same track as the bomb for the length of time it took the bomb to travel 3.1 3 miles and 18,000 feet down, approximately 40 to 45 seconds. It made them an easy target for anti-aircraft and a very easy target for fighters, so you really wanted to control the airspace over your target. At the time, over the Mediterranean, they did, but by the time they redeployed over Normandy, they did not. On their first mission in Normandy, trying to stop the Allies as they rushed in from the Normandy beaches, they launched 12 airplanes on their first day and lost seven of them. They hadn't lost that many airplanes the entire time they'd been in Marseille on their first, their first deployment. The most airplanes they were ever able to field after that was eight airplanes at one time. They never had more than six in the air. Um, and the only targets that they were able to hit with these things were bridges. And they actually didn't hit the bridges because the aerial opposition was so great. So what you just heard is a little piece of story that's a that's, that's part of a much bigger story. And I like Vern's story about the Falcon today because the Falcon story is a big story. But there's little pieces of it that make up history. It's one of the reasons I love history so much. Is that I, as I work through photographs upstairs, as I am looking at airplanes or, or, or uh, researching the history on an individual or an individual aircraft, those little stories are what pops up. And it's what makes history so special. It's probably one of the reasons you are here, is because those little stories, you own parts of them. And that's really, I mean, it's just fascinating. It's so, so cool to be here with all of you, because you all know that, and you all have a little piece of that. The squadron commander, Kampfgeschwader uh, uh, 100, or the uh, three group Kampfgeschwader 100, was a guy named Bernard Jopes. Jobs had a distinguished career. He had a, a Knight's Cross. He had the oak leaves of flight. He managed to survive the war. Dr. also managed to survive the war. Um, both of them had interesting careers after. I, do any of you know what they did after? You get a free donut if you, if you can tell me what, uh, what, either one of, what happened to either one of them, because I, I happen to know. Interesting characters. They went on to interesting careers post war. You're not talking about Jobs, do you? Job? Bernard Jobs. Jobs. Stockings. No. <laughs> Different Jobs. <laughs> Different Jobs. Different Jobs. The point is. There you go. The point is that every smart weapon that we see today owes its origins to the creativity and ingenuity of a scientist who was, off, who was working in the 1930s and 40s to create a specialized weapon. On, August, on September 8, 1943, the U.S. Ninth Air Force had information that Field Marshal Albert Kesselring was in his headquarters in the town of Frascati in Italy, northern Italy. I know Frascati pretty well from my Trader Joe experience. It's a great place for wine. <laughs> I know the secrets of Charles Shaw, too, if any of you want to know. <laughs> On August 8th, the 9th Air Force launched 131 B-17 bombers to try and take out Albert Kesselring. They leveled the town of Frascati. They killed 485 Italian civilians and missed Albert Kesselring. Devices like this that you see behind me here, this device was launched from a B-1 bomber and is seen striking the target speedboat. This device is a smart bomb. It does not require 
that the controller get it there, just that the controller identify the target, and then you're done. No line of sight, no level flight per minute, none of that stuff. It just goes down and it kills a very precise target. They're extraordinarily expensive. But imagine the lives, the cost of lives, at that little town of Frascati, and how something like this could make a difference. Fritz X made a difference, for the wrong side, but it made a difference. So all the smart moms today, all the smart munitions today, owe a, a debt of gratitude to the development, the ingenuity, the creativity of people like uh, Dr. Kramer. about any of the other interesting smart devices that were developed during World War II and have had legs ever since, you're going to have to have me come back. <laughs> <laughs> we can do it.